Welcome. You are listening to Purpose Driven Wealth, the podcast for empowered investors. If you're an investor who is tired of playing the Wall Street casino, stay tuned. On this show, we bring on industry experts to discuss leading strategies to help you make empowered decisions with your hard earned capital. And now, here is your host, Mo Bina. Welcome to Purpose Driven Wealth. I'm your host, Mo Bina. Today on the show, we have George Bravante. George has spent the last 20 years building a vertically integrated farming business. He's the founder of Bravante Farm Capital, which has acquired over 175 million in agricultural assets that include crops like citrus, table grapes, wine grapes, stone fruit, and pistachios. George, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you for coming on. Uh, could you please start us off by talking about your background and how you eventually became involved in the farmland space? I'd uh, love to. I have a crazy story, so people get a kick out of it a lot of the time. So I grew up in New York, went to school in the South. When I graduated from college, and I had an accounting degree, and I went to work in Charlotte, North Carolina. And, you know, I didn't really like the firm. I was Pete Marwick back in those days before it turned into KMPG or whatever. So I had a friend in Newport Beach, and he offered me a trip out to Newport to check it out. Went out there and said, wow, this is great. And uh, never been on a plane before, never went anywhere before. So I packed my stuff in my car and moved out. So I started in the real estate business, you know, public accounting. Then I became the CFO for the be the beginnings of what was you know, for the Robert M. Bass Group. And the Bass family are these billionaire brothers in, in Texas. And we did a lot of... Um, uh, you know, a lot of big transactions and, and both of that business turned into two giant private equity firms, which I worked for Colony Capital in LA and Texas Pacific Group in Fort Worth, Texas. Anyway, amazing young guy career. I was really happy. I had to start having a family and I didn't want to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week on all five continents. So, you know, somehow we landed in Visalia, California for a one year stint on a manufactured housing business deal. And we ended up staying here for a little school, little school for my three boys to start their educational career with. And once I got here, I'm a kind of a deal junkie guy. And there was a big citrus grove that was in trouble. And I stole the ranch basically, got it for a you know, thousand bucks an acre or something, it was really cheap. And, and learned how to farm, learned how to do things and saw the cash flow coming out of the ranch and it was significant, right? So then I bought another ranch and I wasn't really trying to be in the farming business at this time. I just inst instinctually thought it was a good fu fundamental business by doing it. And then we bought another ranch. We got to about 3000 acres, built a packing house, sales company, farming company. Then we got a table grapes, built a cold storage. So anyway, you know, we've, so we did this with friends and family, basically, bootstrapped it up. And, and so now I look at where, so I started this Bravante Farm Capital in a more retail manner, like we're talking about today, about a year and a half ago, because most, I'm 60 years old, 63 years old, and all my partners are like 90 years old or dead, basically, <laughs> right? So, so I need, you know, A, I needed to find another base of capital. I put up 10% of the money in all the deals that we do, but I don't have enough money to put, you know, 10, you know, more than 10%, if I want to do any kind of volume and transactions. And when I say volume, you know, we're talking about maybe one or two or three deals a year, because to find what I'm looking for, it's got to be exactly the right ground, exactly the right water, exactly the right microclimate for me to want to do it. Because that I know we'll have success if we do that exactly right. But there's, there's factors that can happen. But I mean, if you follow that formula perfectly, you're going to come out and make money and the, the branches are going to appreciate. So anyway, we started this. We've closed three deals in the last year, and uh, it's going really well. And a lot of people have a lot of interest. And the other thing for me is, you know, I, you know, we, our minimum investment is twenty five thousand. So it opens up ag to a lot of people that don't have access to it. You know, what I mean, is I mean, we have a lot of lay people that you know, really have always had a like a, a, a like a deep hidden interest in agriculture in a way, but never had you know they can they can go on line and with Ameritrade and buy Exxon, but they can't buy into a farm like this. So anyway, it, and, and it's been, it's been fun for me because they call me and we talk about it, you know, what, what it means and how it works and they're excited about it and I'm excited about it. So 
so far it's been really a great thing. And I, I, I love the idea of people investing with us and more importantly, learning about what we do and how it works. And, and I'm pretty confident they'll be happy with the results too. So economically. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about farmland, uh, are you referring to uh, operations that are currently uh, ongoing or are we talking about farms that used to be previously operating? Uh, uh, how is that kind of, I mean, basically, I mean, basically we're trying to buy the best properties with that have, you know, either the crops on them that are optimal or partially optimal or, and we'll reap and we'll build a little bit of it if we need to. So, I mean, it, it's basically, this is a land business. We want to find the best land with the best water. I mean, we're only, we are only doing this in a very small area on the, what I call the Fresno Plain. So if you look around Fresno, California, there's three water districts there that are the best in the country, probably. And it's and it's a, it's great soil conditions, great climate conditions. So we're focused on this place I call the oasis, right? And that's the place because you know this there's a lot of regulation going on in California on water right now. And so if, if you stray out to these other more ancillary areas, you could be out of water. I mean, next year it, it's very possible. Where we're focused. It's, I, you know, I never say anything's not possible, but it's super improbable we would ever have any trouble with water ever, just based on the geology and the water districts that control the water coming out of the mountains. So anyway, that's, it's a very small, finite area of the best places to do this in California, which hey, means it's for the best places in the world. Yeah. Can you explain further about why that particular area has, uh, I guess you're trying basically saying it has a reliable water uh, source is it what, what's so what's unique well, about here's, a, here's the thing and it, this is hard to visualize your for your listeners probably but you know the sierra mountains even in bad years capture trillions of the gallons of water in the snow up there right in the runoff so if you if you could conceptualize the mountains above fresno north all the way up to tahoe i mean there's tons of water lake creek stuff that come out of there right and it not only on the surface, but underground too. So when Fresno, when the water comes out of the mountains in Fresno, it comes through the Fresno area through like Fowler and out that way. And then it goes north to the Delta. I mean, that, it, it kind of takes a turn and goes north, right? So if you think about this, it comes out of the mountains and like sweeps through the Fresno plain and then goes north underground and above the ground. So it's highly charged. I mean, we're pumping 120 feet you know, and, you know, 30 miles south of us, they're pumping at 2,000 feet, where there isn't this phenomenon. So, and if you just looked at them, I and mean, if, if people go to our website, we have, we have written articles on our website explaining this in detail, exactly kind of how it works and all that. But I mean, you know, we're, I'm, I've been doing this a long time, and I mean, that's the only place I want to do it, you know, where I know the water is going to be good. And, you know, it, it, years ago, 100 years, 100,000 years ago, or maybe less, that water would come out of the mountains and go north and then south of us and went south and created this thing called the Tulare Lake, which is now after this season underwater again. There's like 50, I don't know how many square miles are underwater over there, but the lake's coming back because we had, you know, 800 inches of snow this year. So, you know, but anyway, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a very, very structured approach, what we're doing. You know, we're not going to just, you know, a good deal comes up somewhere else. We're not even looking at it. We're just going to go. Here's where we know it's good. This is where we're going to do it. And that's it. Which means we'll, we'll get one, two, three deals a year probably. You know, so it's it's not like a, a volume game where we're trying to raise money and buy stuff. It's a much more focused, you know, kind of approach. Why isn't there more uh, activity going on in this particular area, given the fact that water is pretty abundant? Well, I mean, every, I mean, everybody wants to go there. It's just that, you know, people have good things, don't sell them that much. And, you know, and a lot of the, a lot of the time you have to redevelop part of it and people don't like doing that. You know, it, it's, it, I mean, it, it was, you know, in other, like in apartments, right? I mean, I used to be in apartment business for years. I mean, you found any land that worked at all right now, you'd build apartments so fast and make your head spin, right? I mean, very efficient business. The ag thing is not efficient. I mean, there's 60,000 farmers that have 40 acres or less that are 80 years old now in the Federal Valley hanging on trying to make it another year. Their kids don't, their kids went to Stanford, don't have any interest in coming home and helping. And, I mean, it's a pretty inefficient market. So, I mean, for instance, you know, ranches trade 
per acre, not by cap rates, right? Not by return. So like if, if you were, if you were selling me your ranch, you'd say, Hey, George, what do you give me for this ranch? And I'd say, I'll give you 29,000 an acre. And you'd say, I want 30, you know, and, you know, in every in office or I've done, I've done office, I've done industrial. I mean, it's always like, well, I, you know, I want to, I want a six cap rate on this deal, which translates to this amount of money kind of, I mean, that's how people think about it in the real estate business. What's my, and then what's my IRR over 10 years? You know, it's a very mechanical mathematic equation when you're buying you know, real estate today and the ag space is starting to get there with more institutional buyers buying prices are going up because they're looking at roi on the deal not on you know what per acre but i mean, I, I bought what 3500 acres you know and then we've done a little pre private equity fund for another 50 million and we're, that we're liquidating today but i mean everything we bought was per acre so far so I mean, it's a it's a given. That that's how it kind of works. And we're we sold a chunk to Prudential Insurance. They got a big ag program. They they didn't tell me how they valued it, but but talking to them, they looked at what's the what's the return over ten or fifteen years. Like what's the ROI over a longer period of time? You know, what's the discounted cash flow? Like they they were doing those analysis, and that's why it was we got a big number from them to do it. So, so if I understand you correctly, so. When, when someone is looking at acquiring agricultural land, are they looking at sales comps? They're not necessarily looking at NOI like you would do like in a lot of commercial real estate space. No, but here, here's the reason though. Depending on who sells it for you, I mean, let's just say we're vertically integrated. We do everything ourselves. But let's say you're just a guy, and you've got forty acres, right? And there's another guy right next to you with the exact same are navel oranges on both places, right? Some places that you take it to do twice as good as the place next door, right? Packing houses don't return the same amount of money. It could be 20, 30% difference, which sounds crazy too, but believe me, it's the way it works. So, you know, I mean, no, you can't, you, I mean, if you have a, if you have a hundred unit building in, you know, in Encino, the five buildings on the street, if they're the same, the rents are the same kind of. You know, they don't vary 30%, right? Because people move out and go next door. They'll, they'll just do that. But in ag, I mean, it's there's so much variability depending on who you who you take it to, who farms it for you. How much does it cost? I mean, if, you know, if, like when we do it, we don't make any, we don't take a profit in the middle, right? You know, we don't mark up what we do. You know, we make our money packing the fruit or whatever. And there's not a lot of money in it anyway. We make, the money we make is more like when we, how much does a ranch make? That's how I get compensated. So we're driving everything to the lowest common denominator, trying to get you know the, the ranch to make more money. But you know, there, there's there, there's so many there's a lot of commercial packing houses out there. Just pack your fruit for you if you have fruit. And I mean, I can tell you, I mean, from the top to the bottom, you know, there's a probably a forty percent delta on what the actual return back to the ranch is. So and all the reason this is the only reason this is important is. That's why two ranches next to each other could make staggeringly different amounts of money, but they'll trade at the same per acre amount because the potential's there, right? If you take it somewhere good, you'll make more money. So, I mean, and that's why it doesn't trade on a cap rate because the NOIs are not dependable. So if I understand so. correctly, are there, there would be opportunities then, like you would see, like, for example, like in an apartment building or in the multifamily space where like someone would come in and do like a value add strategy, right? They'll say- yes. You know the the property is not being operated efficiently, um, and there's let's say any number of reasons why that would be the case. But it sounds like that also all happens in the ag space as well too, and that basically leads to value creation, right? It's like I can come in, and I can you can I can increase uh, or sorry I I can vastly improve the operation that's taking place, and I can add X amount of value uh, as a result of that. Yes, uh, and we we do that. I mean, and there's two ways to do it, right? There's the making more money processing the, the, the crop, right? And you, and you do it more efficiently and better and higher sales prices. The, the ranch makes more money. The second value add that we do is like, we'll buy a hundred acres and it'll be 30 acres on it. That's old and crappy and making, by losing money. So we buy the, buy the ranch, like, you know, like any other value add strategy in, in all real estate, right? You, 
and then we'll fit, we'll put maybe mandarins on that piece that are the most profitable thing in the in the citrus business, and that, that changed the whole, the whole complexion of the deal. But a lot of owners don't aren't capitalized. I mean, you know, it's not that much money in the world we live in, but for them, I mean, thirty acres is three hundred thousand dollars to redevelop, right? And for a, a mom and pop, that's a lot of money, and they don't, they don't want to borrow it, right? And they never get enough to kind of you know redo the ranches. So, I mean, all the, I've, I've redone every ranch we own over the 20 years we've had it, little by little, putting the right things in the right places. I mean, different crops do better in different soil conditions. So, I mean, and we've been doing it forever. You know, we're still not done. We're probably 85% done after all these years trying to get there. So, anyway, that's, that's kind of, it's, it's different, but it's, it, it, it's the opportunity, though, actually. Of that course. inefficiency is the opportunity. Yeah. And you kind of mentioned uh, a few minutes ago about how uh, it sounds like a lot of these farming operations are very fragmented in terms of the size and also in terms of like the owners kind of getting up there in age. So I guess that creates opportunity because at some point, uh, whether it be them or maybe, you know, uh, their children will want to cash out and want to just leave the operation. And I guess that also leaves the opportunity to then kind of pick and find opportunities, right? Well, I mean, you know, the thing that's interesting is right now it's changing radically because money costs something now, right? Look to a year ago where rates were low and money was free, basically. People were more interested in maybe trying to do something with the land back then. Maybe we'll redevelop part of it, borrow the money. I mean, nobody, I mean, it's, it's the markets, the markets coming to people like me that are trying to buy things. And going away from people or status quo right now. And it's probably gonna be for another year or two. Rates aren't gonna come down anytime soon, I don't think. Maybe in 24 months from now, maybe they will after the election or something. You know, it's hard to know. But you know what I mean? It's it's interesting now that money costs something. It's changing and people are like stopped in their tracks. They're not buying things or so the, the mom and pops that are like hoping for a good sale, it's not happening. You know, I mean, it used to be, oh, I used to buy the land, put something good on and make money. I mean, it's it's just such a, it costs quite a bit to redevelop and, and people always borrow that money for the most part. So it's not happening right now. So I'm, I'm excited in a way, right? I mean, more opportunities on the way, it seems to me. Yeah, so it sounds like have things kind of basically slow down in terms of like deal deal flow, but at some point you feel like, you know, the deal flow will improve. Um, well, and I think the deal flow is going to be higher because there's not going to be as many buyers mm. because of what the rates where rates are. And, uh, and just general uncertainty is pretty high right now, right? I mean, people are feeling uncertain everywhere. Yeah. Anyway. How are you, uh, how are you resourcing new uh, farmland opportunities? You know, we're, we've been doing this so long. We've got three or four key brokers that are the key players in the community. You know, we have people come to us once in a while that just know we're there and, solicitous you know contiguous branches that come up come to you first because you'll pay a little more if you're next door but i mean we see most of the good deals i feel like and not all of them but i mean we we get more than our fair share you know and, and the other thing too is i've never not closed a deal i put under contract for 20 years oh right so broker brokers like me they know if i say yes we're going to do it so you know i mean and we're and we're pretty good at due diligence we're pretty good at, you know we're fast comprehensive we do a good job we know i mean you know come in a, like an accounting background like i have and being, being a transactional person you know we're good at due diligence because you know we're just very focused and you know and i'm pretty unforgiving with my my team of people you know, we got to get it right and it's not hard to get it right as you know we just got to do the work and get it right so mm -hmm. Do you mind getting into and kind of covering like what your due diligence process looks like and what kind of things are you really looking for in terms of uh, uh, I mean, the due diligence is like kind of in my mind in two pieces. There's a physical piece, soil testing, water testing, understanding the water district, you know. So there's like this physical part of how good's the soil, how good's the water, how good's the microclimate, you know, is there anything strange about the site? And, you know, and we're good at that, right? I mean, really good at that. Then there's the next part of if there's something there already, look at historical records about production, size, grade. I mean, for instance, if you're buying oranges, are they, how many, what percent went export to Asia? 
right? I mean, that's a good indicator because that's the best, it's got to be the best fruit to make it. So, and since we have our own packing house and our own staff, and I said, well, we do that, we do that very business, you know, we know what to look for, you know, and what makes sense. So, I mean, it's kind of like nuts and bolts, really. I mean, you know, it's, what do you, it's like an apartment, an apartment building, right? You know, how's the plumbing look? How does the foundation look? How's, how's, do we need a new roof? You know, I mean, all that, it's the same thing, basically. And so, and, you know, but I mean, again, it's, you know, we're very disciplined on this because if you, if you, if you make a mistake, it hurts you really bad. You know, if you just miss, miss something. So, um, you know, early in my career, I missed a rootstock deal. So, I mean, every tree or vine comes on our different rootstock. So I bought one on this crappy, unproven rootstock. And it was only like 10% of the deal, but we struggled with it for 10 years before we ripped it out. And it hurt the economics of the deal. I mean, I learned a valuable lesson early to make sure. I mean, I, you know, I didn't really think the rootstock could make that much difference back in those days. And, you know, and I, you know, got, got a black eye and, you know, got, got a lot better at what we were doing early. For uh, investors that are uh, kind of thinking about or interested in investing in farmland, what, what are the potential like risks and downsides that they need to kind of be uh, uh, aware of? You know, I mean, how I think about it is the land historically has appreciated one to 4% a year, right? So that's the base thing. I, that's how, I mean, I feel like I'm in the land business. We grow stuff on the land to push the land to make money. But the, this really good land we're after is just going to be more and more valuable as time, especially the, with the water on it, the good water. is just going to keep growing, right? So, you know, secondly, we this is very low leverage. The way we do it, like 45% leverage. So, you know, it's almost impossible to lose your money. You know, and that's what attracted me to this business, right? As a poor kid growing up in New York, you know what I mean? I'm like, you know, I don't want to lose my money no matter what. I never have. So, I mean... Very low leverage, right? And then, and then you know, weather events. People, people think of farming. Oh my God, the weather's going to wipe us out. I mean, our best years are when we have a weather event. Like if we have a freeze in citrus and we knock off thirty percent of the crop, we make the most money because we have crop insurance helping us, and the prices double. So I mean, unless it's an absolute wipeout, you do better in a weather event, right? You know, we get a little bit of hail, not so far the crop. Oh my God, we're making all this money. So it's kind of counterintuitive how people think about it versus the way it really is. You know, there are, I mean, there are things that have happened that have been very hurtful to me and my, my business. Like, for instance, when Trump put the tariffs on, we really got hurt in table grapes because we used to export 20% to China. And China turned it off immediately. So that tariff went on, they didn't buy one box of grapes from California. So 20%, like 20 million boxes of fruit got dumped back on the domestic market and we lost a lot of money that year. So there, there are geopolitical things. I never dreamed this could ever happen, but it did happen. We recovered, but you know, so that's a risk. That's a real risk to have a bad year, a really bad year. You know, that's only happened once in 30 years that I've seen. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's those kind of crazy, you know, COVID, Helped us because people were buying, were in the store more, buying more fruit. But the the logistics nightmare that happened, getting trucks and containers, hurt us. So we, if we got it to the store or we got it on the boat, we made more, but there wasn't enough equipment to get it all gone. So we did okay, but you know what I mean. It, it just that's they're the risks I think about. I don't think there's much risk in growing it. I don't think there's much risk if, if you buy the right properties. I think you're going to make the the, ec the economic bargain is there, but there are people should consider before they invest in this stuff. There are things that could happen, you know, you know, the, like governmental or I me, mean, for instance, this you know this new it's called Sigma Sustainable Groundwater Management Act in California, which is going to let the government stop you from pumping if you're overdrafting. They're going to stop you if we invested in one of those ranches. Like I was, a, if I was, didn't know what I was doing and I got people to give me money and I bought a ranch like that and they turned off half the water, that's a catastrophe. So, I mean, those kind of things people got to be aware of. You got to be with somebody who's a good operator, knows what they're doing and understands the landscape. 
So there's a lot of risk in that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, but with the area that you're in and what you were talking about in terms of like the, let's say, water security um, and having a uh, reliable and, you know, an ample supply of water uh, basically kind of negates a lot of that, if, you know, from the water aspect, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, I mean, listen, I, we've got plenty of ground. We make plenty of money. I mean, I love to, I love what I do. And the only reason I'm doing this is because I see a giant opportunity in this this area, the oasis area that we're going. You know what I mean? It's like pretty certain about it. You know, it's gonna if you're gonna do it, do it here. That land is gonna be twice as valuable as the land down south. You know, and, and it's a great place to grow things too. The climate's the best. Everything. I mean, water quality is a big issue too, right? I mean, if you're down, you're pumping at thousand feet. Water's not that great. If you're getting it out of the mountains, it's like spring water. You know, it's the best. So anyway, I mean, there's there's risk in everything, but I mean, you know, what I like about this is, you know, properties gonna are gonna appreciate no matter what I think. Especially we're gonna be in a little bit of an inflationary cycle for a while. It's not gonna be huge, but it's gonna be we're we're gonna do better than one or two, I think. And the, the, the risk of losing your money not that good. And then so we have really big years some years. We make a lot of money. So, you know, it, it kind of just works itself out where you're making, you know, I like to say we're going to make six to 12 a current when the ranches are all producing and you're going to make two to four on the, on the appreciation. You know, it's, I mean, we have years, I mean, it's, prices are up a little bit, but, you know, you could, if you buy a piece of property for 35000 you, you could make 20 a year in a good year when it, ha when it happens. You may normally make five to six, but you you know you you can make twenty thousand a year per acre if the things line up and a little bit there's a shortage down south. And I mean, you know, it's 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 a fun, it's a fun business though, it's really fun. You mentioned during COVID that uh, I guess fruit consumption went up. I'd never heard about that. What what led to people eating more fruit during COVID? I you know I think that just the, the, you know the fiber and vitamins like citrus went crazy. It took a dump. And then it just took off, you know, I mean, it was wild. And then, you know, and, and the equipment stuff, I mean, the truck, the problem was for us, a truck to New York went, you know, from 3,000 to 10,000. Like in two months, it just went up because of wow. you know, the dislocation, right? So that hurt us, you know, so we're, they're getting huge amounts at the stores and they're fighting us because of truck prices, like, you know, but we still did a lot better once it cleared. But, you know, the equipment, you know, I mean, getting a container into the port of Long Beach and on a boat was impossible. Right. I mean, it was just so hard to do it. So anyway, it all worked out. But I mean, it's just like, you know, kind of a crazy thing we're doing. Perhaps uh, people realize that in the middle of the pandemic, the, uh, the one thing they should do is uh, consume and eat more vitamin C, right, to strengthen their immune yes. system. <laughs> well, I mean, I think they did that, too. And I mean, if you look at what's in grapes and what's in, I mean, all this all these fruits that we grow are high in you know, different you know, nutrients and, you know, and kind of oxy, you know, oxidants. I mean, all kinds of stuff. I mean, everybody knows they should eat more fruit. You know, I mean, we're in the middle of it. We eat it all day, every day. I mean, it's take it for granted. You know, my poor kid, I had three sons and they went to school back East and they were just so distressed on how bad the fruit was back there. You know, when they, you know they're used to, I just stop with my the neighbors and get some peaches and bring them home and they just picked them and they're amazing. And, they go back to like, you know, piggly wiggly and they're like, oh my God, it's, I wouldn't feed this to the dog. You know, <laughs> so, so <laughs> it's, yeah, you know, so I mean, it's a uh, people, you know, people should eat more of it and, and they should demand more too. You know, some of the, you know, the, you know, a lot of the retailers, the big ones, you know, especially the lower end, like Ralph's and you know, kind of medium guys, they just don't focus on buying the best. You know what I mean? And it's just not that great. So, I mean, years ago, they did. They had a grocery manager, you know, produce manager in every store, and they made sure it was always good. And they, they don't do that anymore. That, you know, the good store, the really high-end stores do it really, like Gelson's or Bristol Farm. They, they, that stuff's, you know, pavilions, that stuff's perfect, you know, they, and they, they do well with it. But the masses, you know, it's, it's not that great. Yeah, I totally know what you mean. Like, uh, we tend to get most of our fruit uh, from the farmer's market, not actually from any store or supermarket. Yep. And the quality and the variety that you get, uh, especially with like, just bringing up avocados, for example, like the variety of avocados that I can buy year round. 
yeah. you know, like in a store, they pretty much just want to stock Haas. You know, that's pretty much become like the universal type of avocado. Um, and then when it comes to like fruit, for example, like, um, uh, you know, the farmer's market I go to, uh, you can get all these different varieties of pluots. And most people don't even know what a pluot is. Yeah. And so it's a, it's amazing, like the, the variety and the quality of fruit that you can get when you go to like a farm. I mean, our, market, our plums this year after the rain are amazing. The pluots we have, I mean, on the tree, they're big already, which is unbelievable. I mean, it's uh, it's going to be a pretty good stone fruit year, it looks like to me. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, um, but, you know, the, the other thing about farmer's markets people don't realize is, like, you know, we have 100 acres of stone fruit. And you know, those guys do a lot of farmer market stuff. because People want fresh stone fruit, right? But, I mean, literally, they're picking it on Friday morning and running it. And they have, like, a caravan of people that come, that come through there and they pick it up. And they're, they're gonna and they'll be there the next morning. So I mean that's that that you know these, not all of them, but I would say the vast majority of the good guys in farmers markets, it's 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 kind of like the, the shortest window of when it gets picked into the consumer of anything you can do really. And people don't think of it that way, but that's what's most important about it, you know. And they and generally they know what it is, right? They have a they have a relationship to the fruit, and they, when they're selling it to you, they can tell you what it is. You know where it can you know what I mean? It's a, it's you know, there's some you know kind of dirt bags out there that don't know anything and are just buying crap and going and trying to rip people off. But that's eighty percent of it's really good. Yeah, totally. I I know that the people that I the farmers that I buy my my food from, I have relationships with them. Some of them I've been buying this I've been buying fruit and food from for for years now. So yeah, you build a relationship and yeah, you're right. And they know their fruit, they know their yeah. food inside and out. Um, they can tell you that, oh, we're in this particular part of the of the reed avocado season. And so the reed avocados are going to have this much oil content and it's going to take approximately this long for them to ripen based on where we are in the season. I mean, yeah, I mean, they can get into all the details and the specifics. And well, here, here, here's the other thing, though, right? I mean, they're not they're, they know you and they know you're a smart guy after knowing you. Right. And then if they used to, if they sell you some crap, you're there, you're going to, you're going to be waiting for it the next Saturday. Hey man, what, what happened? Yeah. You know, they know it, right. They, they lose if they don't perform. Exactly. Because, because expectations are high. They make a lot of money at this because there's no middleman. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a good model. It's just too bad. It's not more of it. You know? Yeah, exactly. I, I wish there were more farmers markets and the farm market, farmers markets that there are. I wish they were larger and had more farmers that were participating in these types of things. So uh, uh, along those lines, um, you know, there's also been kind of a, a growing movement and kind of realization by people that, you know, who want access to like food that's grown organically and that's non-genetically modified. Um, I'm in this particular area where our farming is taking place where you're involved in, uh, are you kind of seeing that? Do you see this type of like designation for the foods as being organic and or non-GMO like important? And does this kind of weigh in on any decision making that you make when you're, you know, I mean, buying it's, a, it's, a particular property? I'm, I'm not a believer in organic myself. I mean, we're we're sustainable farmers. You know, we're really big on sustainability, you know, and everything that goes with it. It is really hard to grow citrus and grapes organically well. And and basically, you police yourself, right? There's not a, you know, FDA isn't doing this. You hire a consultant and they kind of say you're so organic. So for me, I don't believe most people are really doing organic. There's a certain things you can't do organically that mysteriously are going away with these guys. So God bless them. I hope it works out for them. But I mean, I'm just not doing that. So we're, we're much more focused on sustainability you know, less fertilizer, you know, you know, you know, you know, erosion, pollution, you know, all that. We use one color boxes. We don't, we don't want to use ink on our body. I mean, we, everything we can do, we're doing. But, you know, we just are not going through organic designation because I don't, I don't think I can do it legitimately. So we're not doing it. And can you get kind of maybe get more into like how the sustainability is different and why you think that's kind of a better way to go? Well, I mean, it's not better or worse. It's just, you know, I'm, I, you know, I believe in climate change big time. You know, I believe in, you know, taking care of the, the ground that we have. I mean, just cover crops versus tillage, right? Less, less, you know, particularly in the air, you know, less erosion. You know, we are, you know, we have the, the 
you know, the best irrigation systems in the world so we can use less water but still get the crop right. You know, we're very sensitive to more toxic, you know, fertilizer versus, and we use less, to you know, I mean, we just, everything we can do to make it better, we do that. You know, so, I mean, we're good stewards. I just, I just don't want to, you know, kind of make up the, that we're organic and not be organic. <laughs> you know, because, I mean, I mean, for instance, there's this thing called mealy bug in grapes, right? It's, you know, it used to have this, this really toxic chemical to get rid of it. You can't use it. If, you can't use it organic if you're organic. You can't use it. Well, there's no way that mealy bug would blow up your ranch. You got to have it. I mean, you know what I mean? It just doesn't make sense to me. And there's, there's a lot of hoopla about, well, you know, we figured out a way. No, you didn't. You're, just, you're, you're, you're spraying at night when no one's around, probably. So seriously, I mean, I just don't want to, you know, it's just, you know, I have, you know, I have lots of partners. You know, we have some institutional partners. I'm just not willing to pretend, make it up, or lie, whatever you want to call it and not do it for real. So, you know, we're doing everything they do other than we're using, we're using a few chemicals we absolutely have to have, which knock us out of the organic arena. I see, yeah, it makes sense. Um, and how do you help investors uh, who are interested in participating in farmland uh, investments? How do I help them? Yeah, how do you how do you partner with the investors that are interested in, in investing in farmland? I mean, basically, we, work we, we, you know, we have a, we have a, Basically, we have an automated website. It's first of all, it's very education. We have we have made so many videos on every topic you can think of. So people could, even if they don't want to invest with us, they can go to our website, they can look at our testimonials from investors, they can look at, you know, what a bin is, you know, we prick into, you know, how does how does water work? How does, you know, we've it we've got everything we can think of to educate people on what we do, right? So if you invest with us, you're a limited partner. You know, I mean, basically, you, you know, we 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 queue up an opportunity. You know, we have a, a private placement memorandum tells you all about it. You know, the minimum investment is twenty five thousand. You want to do it? You know, you, you 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 sign up and you wire the money in, and we close, and you're a partner. Um, you know, we have a basically the economics are pretty are the same in every deal. We have an eight percent pref. You know, you get eight percent all your money back. Once you get all your money back, we get we we start getting thirty percent of the cash flow. And you know, when you get two times your money back, we get fifty percent, which probably never will happen. It's a ten year term, so I mean, it's a, it's a standard deal in a way. You know, I mean, it's pretty fair. I think I put up ten percent of the money in every deal or more, depending on how much money I got at the, the time we're doing it. Um, my other partners in the deal put up a little bit of money, co invest. So, I mean, pretty standard, you know, I mean, and it's, you know, I pride myself on being a, a, a very, very good fiduciary to these partners because growing up as a poor kid, you know, I take seriously other people's money. Man. I, you know, my wife always bitches, you take better care of other people's money than our money. What are you doing? I mean, you know, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll make some decisions. She gets mad at me because I might give people something that, you know, even if they didn't make it, I might take care of them. But I feel like they, you know, we need to do something to make the deal work, you know. So, you know, that's hard to quantify as we get bigger. But, you know, it's it's very important to me that the investors feel good about what they're doing and don't feel like they've been cheated or not cared for or, you know, and we're, you know, we're a family business. You know, I mean, we're, you know, we're not a bloodthirsty private equity fund. You know, I mean, it's more, yeah. how can we, I mean, it's funny, you know, my partner, John Kirchie's dad, who I love this guy. He's an amazing man. You know, third grade education became a billionaire. I mean, really good guy. And he would tell me when he was young, he had a bunch of packing houses. And he became like the bank consultant for these people. I mean, they didn't, they were farmers in the Orange County area. I mean, they, they owned a bunch of, they, they did a packing house in Fullerton. And a lot of the old gas stations you see on, you know, like on La Brea and all that, they owned all that because when the, when the, when the, when the, after the war, people said, hey, I don't know, do my land, you know, I mean, can you help me? And they were, the, because they bank, they bankrolled everybody. If they needed you know, money to farm, they'd go to Kirchie and he'd say, okay, I'll give you $200 an acre to help you get through it. And, and he just became like the Pied Piper to all the, you know, thousands of people kind of, because they didn't know what they were doing. They were unsophisticated. He, he was unsophisticated who became very sophisticated somehow. And he, he got into the real estate business and got out of ag when he was 50. 
but you know, he would tell me, you know, some years, you know, and he, I mean, he literally would look at all the growers and then he would take all the money and he would just give the people, it was based on what they gave him, but he would help people that needed help a little bit and kind of smooth out the deal where everybody was kind of happy. You know, in this day and age, you can't do that because, you know, that's not the deal, but it was interesting. You know, he was like, a, you know, like the patron of all these people, the godfather kind of. It was, it was very interesting the way he thought about it. Oh, so, that's really interesting to hear. Hmm. Um, George, how can people find out more about uh, Bravante uh, Farm Capital? You know, I, I would, if they're interested in it, they should, our website at bravantefarmcapital.com is really good. I mean, it tells you kind of everything we do. I mean, I'm listed there. If they had questions, they wanted to call me or email me, I'd be happy to talk to them about it. You know, I, I love what I do. I mean, I love talking to people. People think, oh, I don't want to bother you. I'm like, hey, nobody wants to hear this from me. Just call me, please. You know, I'd love to tell you about it. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, and it's, and it's a simple business, you know, and I, I think, you know, if, I mean, I don't think people could stretch to invest in what we do. You know, I would never tell people to stretch, but if you're a real investor and you, and you're building a real portfolio, you should have a little bit of money in the space because it's inflation proof, you know, it's going to grow. It's a great diversity because, you know, most things today you can buy or it's like buying air, you know, to me. I mean, I don't want to buy any stock at 50 times earnings. You know what I mean? People love that. You know, Apple's at 100 times earnings. Yeah. But I mean, you know, I mean, what we have, you're buying a, you're buying a piece of a rock. You know what I mean? You're so it's not for everybody, but I, I, you know, that's all I've got. I got a stock market years ago. We do a little bit of hard money lending and ag and, it's, and I love it just because. You know, maybe it's not as sexy or cool, but I mean, it grows every year. You know, we do okay every year. And, you know, 20, you know like 20 years later, I mean, I, I bought stuff at a thousand bucks an acre. That's now 40,000 an acre, you know, thousand, you know, thousand acres. I mean, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a example and believer, you know, if you're patient and you, you know, especially for younger people have a little bit of money, this is a really great place to be because you just, you know, it'll grow and take care of you in your old age kind of. Yeah. And you're certainly passionate about what you're doing. It's pretty obvious, George. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's a, you know, I, I work with the, the biggest names in business, you know what I mean? And they, they all think I've lost my mind being up here doing what I'm doing, you know, but, you know, I mean, I, you know, I think people return to where they came from. You know I mean? My dad was a mailman. We had a little crappy house in New Jersey outside of New York City. Had the greatest family life ever. You know what I mean? And, you know, and I basically... Gave it all up so I could sit around the table with my three sons and my wife and have dinner every night, just like I did. You know what I mean? That, that sounds corny in a way, but I think people kind of end up where they start, you know, if they're true to themselves. So, yeah, I totally agree. Uh, thank you, George, for coming on to the show today. You provided an amazing amount of value to the audience. Well, thank you. I, I loved it. I really enjoyed the way you, you, you conducted the interview. And if anybody has any questions, come, please have them contact. Yeah, for sure. We'll uh, include a link to your uh, website in the show notes when this uh, interview goes live. Um, so thank you again, George, for coming on. And that's all for today. And thank you, everyone, for uh, tuning in. Until next time, have a great week. Thank you for tuning in to this week's show. If you are interested in learning how alternative investments can help you build purpose-driven wealth, Sign up on the High Rise Capital website to receive our monthly newsletter and free investor ebook. Lastly, if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a five star review. Thank you for listening to Purpose Driven Wealth, the podcast for empowered investors.